Hello, ladies and gentlemen from all over the world. Welcome to ConConf One, our very first mini conference of the series. So there will be more, rest assured. On behalf of the company's team, I am so thrilled to see what an awesome turnout we have. Uh, and more people are coming. We're just really global today. <laughs> uh, keep telling us where you are, put it in the chat. Meanwhile, I am going to set up a little poll just to do a little temperature check on where our mood is at today. So you will see this pop up on your screen. Mood elevator launch. There we go. So you can submit uh, how you're feeling today. Are you feeling grateful? Are you feeling curious? Are you, you know, irritated because it's Thursday and you wish it was Friday instead? <laughs> Or are you feeling something else? Let us know. Lots of curious and interested. That's the spirit. That's what we want to see. Hopeful and optimistic. People are hopeful that this is going to be a great discussion. And boy, do I think it's correct. All right. I'm just going to leave that open for a little bit so that y'all can vote. <laughs> OK, so today we have a very, very special group of agile masterminds gathered together with so much wealth of knowledge and decades of combined experience that I, for one, cannot wait for us to pick their brains. So your questions will be welcome at any time. This is going to be a very interactive type of webinar. So please utilize the Q&A button. Uh, if you have questions, please don't put them in the chat. Use the Q&A. So before we get started, I want to give a quick rundown of how we can navigate this webinar. And very important, first of all, <laughs> today's meeting will be interpreted live in both Spanish and Portuguese. So if you hover with your mouse towards the bottom of your screen, uh, you will be able to see a little globe-like button. And from there, you can select the language that you wish to hear for the duration of today's uh, event. So you have the option of English, Portuguese, and Spanish. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we will assist. Um, and during the meeting, if you want to ask a question in Spanish or in Portuguese, then please use the little hand raise feature also found at the bottom of your screen. And then I will unmute you and then you can ask your question out loud so that our interpreters can interpret for everyone and everyone can understand what you're saying. Because if you type it in the chat, we're not going to be able to do that. So if you're going to type it in the chat, then please write it in English. I'm going to post these instructions in the chat so that anyone who is a latecomer can also um, can also make sure that they know what to do. <clears throat> OK, there we go in the chat. Okay, there we go. Okay, so that's that. Moving on. Um, if you have questions, I repeat, please put them in the Q&A, not in the chat, or we might miss them. Uh, and you also have the, question, the option to upvote questions that you like most, because if we have more questions than we can answer, we'll focus on the ones that have been upvoted to the top. So use that feature. Let's see how our little poll is doing. So people are feeling grateful, optimistic, mostly curious and interested. That's the spirit. That is awesome. Wonderful. I'm so glad to see you guys are curious because you're in the right place if that is the case. So I will pass it over to the company CEO, Dimitar Karaivanov, to say a few words to you guys. Thank you, Veronica. It's really uh, amazing to be here. Welcome, everybody. Um, this is the first ever CanConf event, um, CanConf 01. And uh, to be very open with you, it's not exactly the very first event because CanConf started probably five or six years ago as an internal event at Kanbanize where we would get together as teams and just share between each other what we learned, what, what worked, what we succeeded in, what we failed with. 
And today is a very, very sp special moment for us because back then I was dreaming that someday this could be a global event where we get together with amazing thought leaders from all around the world and share and learn together. So this dream that was just a dream back then is now coming true. So I'm very humbled and happy uh, to see that coming. At, at Canvas, we've always been a company of explorers. We've always reached for the limits of Fadro and Lean and management and everything, just to see what's beyond those limits. And that's why CanConf exists, because we want to explore together. This event today, the very first one, goes back to the roots of Agile, to the very moment in time when the actual Agile manifesto was signed. Hence, our special guest today. We'll meet him in a minute. The second event, which will be a few months from now, will aim to go to the roots of Lean. I assure you that the team is working hard to find the best person at Toyota that uh, can speak to us next time. So stay tuned for that. The third and the fourth events this year will focus on the Kanban topic, which is of course uh, our specialty. So stay tuned, we're only just starting. I want to thank you again, and I hope you find this event helpful and enjoyable as much as we do. Thank you. Awesome, how wonderful. Okay. Um... So I would also like to take this opportunity to extend a thank you to PMI Bulgaria chapter for their support of today's event and make sure that everyone has access to um, the claim form because you're eligible for one and a half PDUs if you are certified. Um, so I am posting the claim form in the chat. Uh, so take a look, make sure to claim those PDUs Thank you, PMI, for your continual support. And we look forward to working together for future events as well. So with that being said, it's my honor to present our panelists. I am honestly shaking with excitement. I even locked the cat out of the room because that's how important this event is. Like usually he'll just kind of <laughs> scroll through the screen. He's out. Super, super excited for this. So ladies first, we have um, Teodora Bojeva joining us all the way from Spain. Teo is, the, <laughs> Teo is the founder and CEO of Berry Process Agility, a training and consultancy business based in Spain. She herself teaches and coaches companies who want to develop their organizational agility and achieve better outcomes. She believes Kanban is the best method for, pro for the project and service related needs of companies nowadays. And she even worked with David Anderson to develop the Kanban maturity model. So she will be happy to answer questions about it. I challenge you to prove her wrong about her Kanban thesis. I bet you can't, <laughs> but I challenge you. <laughs> Next up, we have Keith Howells on our panel. He is joining us from London, England. Keith is the, and I, I underscore England because I, I saw in the comments that someone was joining us from London, Ontario. So Keith is in England, different Londons for sure. <laughs> Keith is the managing partner at Project for Learning Lab, where he applies his knowledge on agile, combined, and lean methods across loads of businesses and very large teams, coaching leaders and enabling transformations. So Keith is your go-to person for questions on product development, new product introductions, where he is a total expert, as well as large-scale, <laughs> yes, Keith, don't be shy, <laughs> as well as large-scale agile for hardware development, integrating hardware and software development, integration of Kanban and Scrum, and the psychology of change and changing behaviors, because we know that change is super, super hard for people and companies. All the way from Brazil, we welcome Luan, Luan Oliveira, who is the managing director of our brand new company's Brazil office. So how awesome is that? Luan has expertise in digital product development and lean agile techniques to improve organizational efficiency and efficacy. You can ask Luan about digital and cultural transformations, Kanban at scale, portfolio management and OKRs. He will back these up with his experience over 15 years in finance, telecom and public sectors. 
And finally, our special guest tonight, Dr. Alistair Coburn, co-author of the Agile Manifesto, the author of award-winning books, Agile Software Development, The Cooperative Game, as well as Writing Effective Use Cases. He is also the co-founder of the International Consortium for Agile, the creator of the Heart of Agile concept, and he is known for his extensive interviews of project teams, which form the basis for his methodology. If you ask him, he will tell you that the Agile Manifesto was written about the practices back in the 90s, and he acts as a historian of sorts for what produced the manifesto in 2001. But in more, more, more recent times, he's focusing on the subject of Agile in the places of leadership. I can go on and on about how ridiculously experienced and accomplished our panelists are, but that just eats away from our Q&A time, so enough of me. Dear panelists, uh, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and if you would like to say a few words, now is a great time. As an intro, of course, you'll be speaking the whole time. <laughs> uh, but uh, afterwards, we'll be heading into our pre-submitted questions. And um, yeah, so if you would like to say a few words as a welcome. You can do uh, that. Veronica, could I just do a second mic check because I'm trying to yes. see if I can do without this. Is that volume okay? That volume is perfect. I'll take these little suckers out. <laughs> yeah, I, the headphones failed me today as well. So, <laughs> okay. Um, so everyone is set. All right. Then I guess I'll just dive into the pre-submitted questions. Are we good? Okay. Efficient, I love it. <laughs> All right, question one. <clears throat> Agile Manifesto does not cover aspects related to leadership, organizational design, data, among others. What do you recommend to deal with them aligned with Agile values and principles? I would love to defer this question to anybody else. I can take this one. Um, I was thinking about this last night and I think values and principles are by definition what defines a person's behavior, right? One's judgment of what's important in life. So if you put this in the context of an organization, the values should be driven, uh, the, the tough decisions should be made. So in practice, uh, regarding the question, let me give you two examples. When you need to make a decision regarding leadership. If the organization is truly agile, then it probably would seek for leaders who value individuals and interactions over process and tools. You would develop uh, leaders who are actively listening and collaborating with customers more than negotiating contracts, right? The second example would be the organization design. So you have to respond really quick to the changes that happen inside and outside your organization and adjust the team, especially in times like this when sometimes you just cannot hire the person that you need because the whole marketing is hunting and paying whatever it takes to get that specialist. So the organization needs to adapt to cover that flaw, that gap or, or that bottleneck. And I think that's certainly more important than following the plan to reach the perfect uh, Spotify model, right? What do you guys think? I wonder if the intent of the Excel manifesto was to cover all that many aspects uh, of managing organizations, uh, managing work uh, in teams with customers at all levels of the companies. Uh, I rather see it as an expression, uh, as a manifesto of the values of the teams uh, who are um, willing and seeking and discovering different ways of work and not necessarily has to cover all the aspects of managing work in organizations, but maybe Alistair can, can give more insight on what was the intent and how they came I'll do to that right after Keith speaks. Yeah, I, I, I was going to ask us to the question, but I, I think it, my, my understanding was the guys came together to try to seek alignment on some of the key challenges that they faced around mm -hmm. developing new products, 
tips and some helpful practices and unhelpful ones. And um, I, I, I think there's quite a lot of store placed in the Agile Manifesto, even though it's like 20 odd years old. And, and, and I think that's interesting. The world's always going to evolve. And, and what we're really talking about is our ability to evolve quickly and learn quickly. And, and there's a great set of principles and values that, that were articulated at the time. There's a whole host of new technologies and capabilities that exist, and there's a whole host of leadership challenge that exists as the world becomes even more volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And, and, and I think it's unrealistic to expect all of those to be characterized back then, and it would be unrealistic to characterize them in a, in a way now that would help everyone in every circumstance. So I think there's a, there's a question about what is it from there that serves us today? And, and how can we apply those things and learn fast? Um, but I'm interested in Alistair's point of view, Ryan. Yeah, so what I'm, <clears throat> what I'm gonna do, and, and, and thank you, you guys for setting that up. The, the question was asking into the future, right? So, and I'm notoriously, I'm famous for not being able to predict the future. Like I thought it was a dumb idea to write a manifesto. So like never ask me about the future because I could tell you what happened recently, but I, yeah, yeah no, not the future. So to, to, so the question was oriented toward the future more than why did we write the manifesto? But if I pick this apart, why did we write the manifesto? What were we targeting? So exactly as all the rest of you said, what were we not targeting, right? And then to address the question and you know, you brought in a lot of stuff organizational design and data and, you know, like all, a lot of things. I just pick off the organizational design aspect. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, in 2000, in that time period, 1998 to 2000, end of the 20, uh, of the 1990s, we were fighting a very particular battle. And the battle we were fighting was really with the Software Engineering Institute, you know, with the capability maturity model and the project management institute and the ISO 9000 and we were also pretty distressed by RUP and the heavy tools thing so so when you read the manifesto you can read what's on our mind it was this over that and the that you can really literally and that's RUP that's uh, PMI that's CMM right you can literally point at it we were saying and, and people go, why, why did you stop and just say working software? Like, what's, why did you, we were not allowed to deliver software. We were begging for the right to talk to our users and customers and deliver them something. That's what we were begging for. So we stopped, like, if you just let us talk to the customers and the, and, and the users and deliver some software and get some feedback, we could maybe do something, right? So we were literally involved with the customers. So, you know, the UI people say we weren't involved enough with the customers. So, so contextually in the historical perspective, you know, what, what Keith said, we were fighting a particular battle, right? And so the words reflect all of that. Um, the second thing is that we were aiming for small teams. You know, at the time our teams were like a big project with 20 programmers, you know, or you, you might get 50, right? When I was doing my stuff in the, in, in the mid nineties, we'd have four, we went to nine. Nobody knew what to do with nine small talk programmers at the same time, you know? Uh, so the Hall of the Manifesto is really oriented toward teams, and, and it's this mid-scale that it's oriented toward. If you know what your initiative is, and you have teams, and we now know how to scale that up to 300, it doesn't matter, but they know what the target is, then this is a good set of stuff, right? And, and apropos, Keith said, 20 years, it doesn't matter. We just said, there are like 200 things you could choose to, 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 to center on that are no that important. We picked four, these four things, give us these four things we can operate, right? And, and so we cherry picked four things and that's why it's still valid after 20 years. Um, <clears throat> but now we get to the question about the future and the organizational design. There's a fundamental shift um, that I've written about when I call large scale and small scale. Small scale is a number of people, it's the fact that you know what the target is, you have an initiative. When you go to organizational design, you don't know what the target is. You've got turf wars, you have divisions. You, you don't even know what the direction is. Everybody's going for like whatever their heart is and they're pulling and pushing over what is our direction. The manifesto hasn't got anything to say about that. It says, if you know what you're doing, get these people and put them together and get some feedback. And then you can, you can chase down after a target. 
So the, the historical thing, it's small teams. We were fighting a battle. We picked four values, read it that way. The values will last for a long time. Saying small teams will bound the, the applicability. And when you go to organizational design, you're really dealing with uh, 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 rewards, incentives, pride, turf, right? And choosing a direction, and ah, that's a different topic. So that's how I, I, and you notice I did not make any predictions into the future. And I didn't say where to go to learn about that stuff and so on. Also, the title is Manifesto for Agile Software Development. It's not a Manifesto for Agile Organization Development or something like this. Yeah. I'm really taking notes. So thank you, guys. Uh, I just want to add my two cents to this because there was leadership in the question, and that's a topic I enjoy and uh, I, I read a lot. Actually, I think maybe not intentionally, the, the manifesto talks about leadership because when you focus on individuals and interactions uh, and you, you don't focus so much on process and tools, and I say that as a tool vendor, uh, what, what remains is leadership. So I think the, 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 the manifesto talks about leadership, even though it doesn't explicitly say so. So yeah, I, I, I think that's right, Dimitar. But I think the, the, the role of the leader has evolved as the world has evolved. And, and the challenges that leaders have today in this world have evolved beyond all recognition and will do again in the next 20 years. But, but I think at, at the core of that is the ability of the leader, particularly with scale, to align and engage the organization around the goals of the project or program, recognizing that complex ecosystem that they're working in and all the incentives that maybe drive them to do different things. So that for me, that concept of alignment, are we aligning large numbers of people around the goals or the objectives of this program? and the ability to engage all of those people so that they can make better decisions every day around what they're going to do to further the goals of the organization, I think is a really important um, approach for leaders looking forward. I agree. So Ver Veronica, I, I think this group <clears throat> of speakers would have, will have a lot to say about leadership um, and that could be interesting, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what the audience wants to hear about. So. I am curious to see where you choose to, to put the accents in the upcoming hour. I also find it as an expression of leadership, the fact that you put these four statements on paper and communicate <clears throat> it to the world, this is an expression of leadership. So all the people who would follow and who would defend these values in their companies are in effect leading oh, oh, I, I, I have a, a thought of building on that Theodore, that's very interesting um i spent a lot of time trying wondering why was it so successful because many people have done many initiatives and this was ridiculously successful and part of the reason it was is because we were so different and we agreed to disagree like we started off the meeting by saying you know we're, we will we will be competing with each other we we think there's a bigger ocean to be built where if we all pull people into that ocean right it, it will be a bigger ocean but we have to we have to agree to compete right so we left space to compete now if you look at the the, the reason it's successful we've got like like um kent beck was out proselytizing in the late 90s and totally changed the world by himself and ken schwaber introduced the certified scrum master certificate and that training program, which totally changed the world. And Jeff Sutherland's been out there, you know, talking about uh, his hyper productivity thing um, as, as a salesman, right? And I'm kind of the scientist and theoretician in the group, and I'm doing my theory stuff. And then you've got Martin Fowler, you know, writing his books and Jim Heist, right? So the, the, no one person or no one small group of people could have covered that personality space. And then leading like, you know, we might not all like love each other, but deep respect for how each person has managed to make inroads into totally different spaces based off of those different personalities. And so when we talk about leadership, um, it was a leader, leaderless uh, meeting. It was very deliberately a leaderless meeting, which is the kind that we all love. Um, there was no leader at the beginning of the meeting. Bob Martin called it and he said, I really think we should write a manifesto and then he was smart enough to sit down 
and not try to lead after that. Um, so that was a, totally a, a, a co-creation event. Uh, so just when we talk about, about leaders, right? that was a leaderless event and we all led according to our personalities, if you will. And I think it became so successful because of that breadth of, of goals and you know, interests that we had. Allow me to um, jump in because any one of these questions could be a three hour webinar in and of itself, but we, I would like to encourage us to, to keep going so that we can um, cover at least the pre-submitted questions that we have. Um, so something else that we've been asked is, given what you know of Kanban, how do you think the getting together of minds at Snowbird in February, 2001, might have been different if David Anderson, the author of the Kanban method had been present? This is a question from Damon Parker of BP in Melbourne, Australia. So am I, I think I'm the only person who can pick up that question, right? And I know Damon. Damon, what are you doing with that question? So Damon knows <laughs> that questions. Yeah, shout out to Damon. Um, we were very clear when we got to the very end and we said, hey, we think we did something pretty cool here. You know, what do we call ourselves? And we said, oh, we're the signatories. And we said, well, no, we're, we're, we're more than that. You know, and so we were the co-authors, right? So we wrote that and so everybody could, could then sign. And they said, well, do we update this? You know, is this something that we update? And then somebody said, no, you can't update it because this is exactly these 17 people in this particular mood. You would add any one person, add or subtract any one person and the outcome would be completely different because everybody had an effect there. So for sure, if you would add David Anderson, it would be different. Um, we missed Rebecca Wirsbrock terrible omission, um, she would have changed it. Jim Copeland wasn't there, he would have changed it. There are just so many people who could have been there. Any one of them would have changed that constellation. Words would have been different, everything could have been different. So yeah, I I'm predictable in what direction, just we just know that any shift of any person would have made a different outcome, unpredictable what. There's actually a second part of his question that goes, um, there are obvious alignments and synergies between the Kanban method and your heart of Agile. Um, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, so, so people, I, I don't know in the audience how many people are familiar with the Kanban method spelled with a capital K as opposed to Kanban with a little K, which to me is a bit confusing and you always have to be very clear. You're talking about the Kanban method as, as Damon you know, put it. Um, I wrote a blog post shortly after the Kanban method came out saying that we were talking about methodologies and, and frameworks is also a bad word. I don't, framework really means I don't know what it is. So I'll just call it a framework and do something with it. Uh, that, that Scrum, uh, Crystal and Kanban, capital K Kanban are not methodologies. Um, they're what I call reflective improvement frameworks. It's a lot of syllables. It's the best I can get. Um, the thing with the methodology or process, it tells you what to do, like do, 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 do. You can't add them. I was literally told in the mid nineties, I had to add three different methodologies together for a project. And I flat out refused because you have too many instructions, too many ceremonies, too many work products, and you, you kill the whole project. Now, if we look at a reflective improvement framework, it only has guideposts. All it says is think about this and decide what to do. Scrum, in fact, does that. It says, it says ship every month, meet every day. And that's your only guidepost, ship every month or whatever your sprint length. That's your only real guidepost, ship every sprint and talk every day, right? And, and if you just hold onto that guidepost, it will lead conversations in a certain way. Um, Kanban with a capital K, again, has a couple of guideposts. Look at the work in progress, da, 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 start where you are, right? But it has a couple of guideposts. It says, look at those guideposts and then talk about it and figure out what to do. Um, Crystal was the same with the properties and, and, and this is the, the mug somebody's were referring to. The heart of Agile just has four words, not, not even those center three, but just the four on the outside, collaborate, deliver, reflect, and improve. Just those four, there is nothing more to the heart of Agile than exactly those four, there is nothing else. Um, so I stripped out everything and there, there isn't even really a guidepost there. And, and they're not phrased as values, they're not principled, they are literally commands. The command says, collaborate, damn it, 
right? But, but Alistair, but we need some techniques. What's the, you know how to collapse, you know, right? You know how to collapse, you don't want to. You don't want to, but you know how, right? Deliver, delivers technical, that's how you get your feedback, stop and reflect and improve, right? So those are commands, they're imperatives. So they're not, they're not even guideposts, they just as do these, you know, but they're guideposts. So, so these things, Crystal Scrum, uh, Capital K Kanban and Heart of Agile, are reflective improvement frameworks that don't tell you how to do anything. They orient you to look at things and then as human beings discuss and decide what to do. So it's a different character. They're, it's a different beast than methodologies. I'm curious okay. what Theodora has to add to this as a co-author of the Kanban maturity model. Theodora, do you want to? <laughs> um, I don't see the Kanban method as a framework. Um, because it's like it includes practices. Uh, I agree in the sense that the practices are not mandatory and I would like that people uh, think about how these practices uh, could help them resolve their real problems. And based on this decide how they want to ad adapt these practices to their context. Concerning the Kanban maturity model, uh, I'm still in the office. I couldn't go home. That's why you see this decoration behind me. But this is the poster of the Kanban maturity model. Please do not accept it as a checklist. Do not accept it as a methodology. It's a, um, it's a list of practices that we have observed in companies who use Kanban and we have observed their evolution. Uh, and we have seen how um, the practices, the uh, application of the practices or the usage of the practices uh, changes uh, during their, the, the evolution of these companies. And we have documented these different instances of the practices if we are talking kind of software development language. So if you see visualize and we you see plenty of practices under visualize, this is because in the beginning you start with very simple visualization like to do doing done, just the tasks, but gradually you start um, using or visualizing different aspects of the work that help you make decisions faster, understand what is the status of the work, understand how you work, how you function, uh, where are the maybe weak points in your process or things like this. So to me, Kanban is a method, but I think it's not that important here, uh, this vocabulary. Um, and about uh, the similarities between the heart of Agile and Kanban and the Kanban maturity model. Right now, I'm working with a company, with a bank that started with the heart of Agile. And they really do, uh, uh, did a great job that really helped me afterwards to, to start uh, introducing and talking with them about Kanban and the Kanban maturity model because uh, all these these four elements of the heart of the agile that you saw on Alistair's uh, mug, uh, they already had thought about, do we collaborate? How, how do we work together? They didn't collaborate in the beginning. So deliver, what does it mean to us? Uh, do we work focused on delivering uh, valuable work to our customers? Um, do we improve? Do we take time to reflect? So all this previous work that they did was really helpful. And um, I have to ask them how they uh, came to Kanban and why they, they wanted, why they decided to start with Kanban and the Kanban maturity model, but they really fit very well together and I enjoy this. Yeah, I think they're pretty much compatible. A yeah. Kanban just adds a little bit more guidance how exactly you would do this and how exactly you would do that but there's no contradiction in my no, this, is, this is this is what i want to say about about and and it's a horrible long pile of syllables but you know a reflective improvement framework right they're additive methodologies are not additive processes are not additive but if all you're going to say is here's a guidepost and think about it and decide because you're smart people then they're additive so I decided very, very deliberately, there is nothing behind those four words that's part of the heart of Agile because there are so many ways to go forward. It's not for me. And, and it's a learning thing. It's the, you know, the ladder of learning that Theodora was describing. Everybody says, how do I get started? 
And then you're in a trap. Then you have Scrum 101 with all the processes and all the questions that are, and people get trapped by that. And so my version, um, this is like my third or fourth round of writing these things. My version, my way of getting out of that is I literally refuse to say, like I've got Alistair's favorite techniques. I will show you Alistair's favorite, but that's not part of the heart of Agile. Just pick the four words. And so it's, I'm delighted. Theodora, that anybody was starting this and then they got to, hey, we need some help on the internal flow aspects of, right? Broom, off they go to somewhere. Mm -hmm. And Keith, yeah. I cut you off. Yeah, Keith has something to say. No, I, it, the key is to learn fast, right? So any Absolutely. rapid improvement framework, any anything that helps you reflect on the actions that have been taken and refine what happens next is designed to learn fast or learn faster. And, and whatever methods you want to put around that, if it serves you, fantastic. If it doesn't, try something else. And, and it's those feedback loops that should be informing that, right? Rather than, are we rigidly defining this method along a pathway that someone says is the pathway that we should be following? And if only you followed that pathway, that will lead you to untold riches and success. It, it's just incredible nonsense, isn't it? So are we learning fast? Is it serving us? And I think those reflective frameworks allow us to do that. Okay, thank you everyone. <laughs> okay, next question. I move right along. How do you deal with we one of the we actually stopped talking for after that question? We actually stopped. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So um, how do you deal with one of the most common resistances at, uh, to break down larger pieces of work into smaller ch chunks that suit a sprint duration? Do you allow teams to start without this key principle or do you not stop until you convince them by highlighting the purposes and advantages? Yeah. Maybe good to hear from Luan for a change. He's probably got right. something to say about this. Okay, um, well, I think, uh, generally speaking, um, I like Kanban, obviously, right? So you should start with what you do now. Dealing with changes is always hard for people. And the more you confront, the more resistance you get. So one common technique that's very famous, uh, and I've successfully introduced it in, in several teams, um, is to use the, the red squirrel, gray squirrel technique, right? Uh, I don't think we should explain about squirrels now because it would just take, I don't know, five minutes and people can just Google it. But basically it is a technique where you introduce a stronger, a stronger method and you just let the weak method die by itself, right? So, and, and the example, the stronger method could be a probabilistic forecasting method. So if you want to be 80% or 90% uh, certain about the delivery dates, then you need to reduce variation. There's, there's no other way. Um, you could implement that for a single team or, or for a single project, show actual results, um, and then by evidence, you could also introduce a bit of stress factors, asking questions to the people like, do you know when other projects will get done uh, as we did for the pilot? Do you trust the deadlines you usually get? Do you usually deliver on time? And what if we apply this method that work at the probabilistic forecasting technique more often, and then the, others, the other method will, will, will die over time eventually? Uh, Veronica, I apologize. I was a little bit distracted. Would you mind to repeat the question, please? Of course, not a problem. So the question says, how do you deal with one of the most common resistances to break down larger pieces of work into smaller chunks that suit a sprint duration? Do you allow teams to start without this key principle or do you not stop until you convince them by highlighting the purpose and advantage? Okay, thank you. Does it make sense? My answer to Dora, I think yes, it's absolutely. <laughs> like water, right? You just go around absolutely. The yes, so, I, I wouldn't. I... So, um, 
Here's a question for everybody. What's the optimal sprint length or what is even a good sprint length if you don't like the word optimal? How do you choose the sprint length? We don't do sprints. <laughs> I think, the, uh, honestly, I think the optimal sprint duration is no duration, you just ship. So uh, what's your, what's, I'll, I'll shift it then. So what's the maximum time period between deliveries from any team? Yeah, yeah. and it comes to what, what you're defining as delivery, doesn't it? And I think context is massively important. So I think- I'm saying delivery, delivery to a customer, a user, and someone's using it. And anything short of that wasn't a delivery and you call it deploy, you call it deliver, whatever. If it's not out there being used, it didn't happen to us people, yeah. right? In the other world. And my question, if you don't, you know, if you're doing Kanban continuous delivery, you still have the same question. What's the maximum del time period between deliveries that you really are willing to tolerate? I, I think it depends on, on the service you're providing. If it's a major incident, the maximum should be in terms of hours. If no, 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 that incident. I'm talking about development. Like, how about every two years? I think every two years is a good number. <laughs> no, then, then I think more creative process. Um, I don't know. I don't expect any of product experimentation, any of testing be longer than a month. Two years, I'm telling you. Two years is the number. I think you should... You should I'm, not even, I'm not even joking because I have clients who work in the oil industry they have to deliver every year and they complain bitterly, bitterly, bitterly about having to deliver every year. They want two years. So now, apropos that question, apropos that great question, what's your entry into this, into this organization? Don't talk two weeks, one month stuff. They, why, why a year? Why anything less than a year? They complain about one year. So just get it anything shorter than a year. How, how do you do that? It's, just, it's a great question. And the difference is that the person who asked the question can't pursue you around like I can, so I'm doing that for them. <laughs> I, it, there's lots of play, isn't there? You, you know, if, it, if you're talking about delivery to a user to get feedback and learning fast, then it depends what it is that you're creating, but you're gonna have a preference on as quickly as you can because you wanna inspect, you wanna be able to adapt and evolve and you wanna be able to accelerate the delivery of value. If, if you're delivering a service and you're just configuring something that already exists, then your, your lead times are gonna be shorter, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, and, but and, you're, you're and, changing and I the think, question. It's not product no, 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 I'm, I'm with you. Exactly, Alistair. So if you're no, creating no, no, something- No, over to incident so, management. That's a different game. I, I, exactly. So if you're creating something that didn't exist, you're gonna be doing something that someone's never done before because that's where value is created, right? So if you're developing, something like software and it's relative if, if the software you're developing is relatively simple but it's with, within an innovative context then you can probably do that really fast <laughs> there's a client i'm working with at the moment and they're worried about their delivery in 2035 and and we've been talking today about will they be able to deliver in 2035 mm -hmm. and and, uh, and wow. it sounds like a crazy question and it depends what you mean by delivery, doesn't it? And, it? and it depends where you're getting your feedback from and what risks you're trying to mitigate and how your, what your lead time is for development. But whatever it is, it can be quicker. And the quicker you deliver and get feedback and the quicker you're able to inspect and adapt, the better. So I think wherever you're starting from, I, I think quicker. But I think the psychology in the, it, behind the question of change People don't change if you rationally tell them that something's better for them. They, they change in light of their experience and the tension that's applied to either make them uncomfortable with where they currently are or to dangle a carrot that gives them something in the future. So well, the, reason, I, the, the, I, reason, the reason I, I, I shifted that is because we're a little bit spoiled and, and we're used to these really, really short time periods like two weeks. and. Well, I go places, they're, they aren't delivering every two weeks. I'm sorry, they, you know, they're, they're lucky if it's a couple of months, right? And, and so there's this bias. Someone asked this question and we leap to the, like the one week, two week time frames, but that's not when the deliveries are happening. And so I wanted to like take the, like the 
the worst case I've ever seen of two organizations where they complain about annual deliveries. I beat so that yours. We're in the question, <laughs> say, so I like three months. Three months is my number. Since the mid '90s, I go every team. If I had one sentence for every team everywhere in the world, every project, every everything, it would be. Every three months, every team must deliver something at least to what I call a fire drill delivery, right? Integrated fire drill pretend delivery. It aligns nicely with the, you know, the, the company's quarterly cycle. It's enough time to develop something, to do all the integration and put it out there. And longer than that really needs a hard excuse. And less than that is nice. So, so for me then, if we go back to the original question, I'll fight tooth and nail to get, and I've lost in those two companies I talked about. I lost both times trying to get quarterly, even a fire drill, even an integration pretend delivery fire drill, I failed. But if I get the three months, then you can, then you can shorten up and, and, and get some mileage out of it. And, and, and three months can be, it can be, there's an edict. How do you convince people at, at a three month level can be a management edict. This is thou shalt deliver integrated every three months. So that's the way to do that. And then after that, there's a different psychological game. I, I, I think that's the, the question there. I, I'd agree with you, Alistair, just from my bit. So three months is really significant and it aligns with the business cycle. And that's a great way of connecting leadership uh, at all levels in a business with development teams. I, I think the idea of delivery depends on where you are. Like I said, my, my experience of Agile is in hardware product development. And sometimes you don't get, you don't get lead times of three months depending on the complexity of the hardware. So it comes down to what is, what are we defining as delivery? And I, I would define delivery as, as learning and risk mitigation. So we're removing uncertainties that we're carrying uh, by learning fast. Yeah. Um, so is breaking down a big chunk of work to smaller pieces, because if I remember well, that was the question, how do we convince someone to break down a big piece of work into smaller chunks? Uh, in general, I think if we start, if we try to convince somebody to do something, this would be a hard job in many cases. So uh, I would not try to convince them by means of arguments. I would rather let them uh, start with uh, with this big chunk of work, visualizing it at least, then asking asking them to um, reflect about how will they manage risks related to losing control of this big piece of work. How would they know whether something is happening to this piece of work, and they get this feedback very late when they when it's already late to make some decisions and correct the course of development. So. I think when people start asking themselves this type of questions, they realize that uh, visualizing and using um, big managing, trying to manage big pieces of work is not convenient. And they decide to, they themselves reflect and find out which are the smaller pieces uh, that compose the bigger work, the bigger job. I want to jump in with, with a quick story here, just like a minute. When we started Kanbanize back in 2010, uh, we were doing monthly releases. And like 12 years ago, this was big. Now, if you say you're doing monthly releases, you look lame. But you know what? We still do monthly releases. And you know what? You know why? Uh, well, because our clients are not willing to accept change more frequently than that. We experimented with releasing weekly um, new features and our, our client just complained, you keep changing stuff too often. So we reverted back to, to monthly and apparently this works great for our client base. So I would say it's always great to break down stuff, but, but let that be aligned with the customer's needs and the customer's perception of what you do. Just something to think about. And how well the customer is prepared for, for receiving the delivery. I have one more thought on this, but Veronica, I want to give you the option to change to a different question. Yes, let's do that. I know it's just, there's always, there's always many, many more thoughts and uh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to push right through. <laughs> okay. We're almost through our pre-submitted questions. <laughs> so we have one that's, that asks, 
um, most organizations implementing agile practices, methods, and frameworks exhibit low levels of maturity, uneven demand and capacity, lead time, fat tail distributions, rework product, product quality problems. What should be the agenda for the next 20 years of agility so we can tackle these issues? The question into the future, so I go on mute. <laughs> I'm I'm going to say the psychology of change and and leadership particularly in a world of instant gratification I think that's a, that's going to be a really big challenge because because what we're we trying to do we're trying to learn fast so it's about speed of learning right so it, we've got to move away from a world where people believe that if we follow a pathway that someone else has already followed or someone defines is the way to follow it that it will lead to success and so we have to we have to create in our organizations a learning culture that allows us to learn fast and and we have to frame things as experiments right so scientific thinking you know the, the hypothesis if i take this action i'll get this result I took that action. Did I get that result? Yes, no. If no, there's some learning in that. What is it that I take from that that would inform my next my next action? And I think it's it's that stuff and getting smarter on that because that's how we're going to create value in whatever context we're in. And I know Dimitar loves that stuff, so I just put a little provocation in there. I said the word hypothesis, and I know that he just can't you know, my contain ears himself. Up right away. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was actually going to second what you said, Keith. I think leadership is, at the same time, so much overrated and so much underrated. And uh, you know, I've been a big proponent of authentic leadership. I think we should talk a lot more about it. Um, because the situation with leadership is almost the situation uh, is like almost the situation in Agile. You have so many different things and so many schools of thought that try to tell you what the right type of leadership is while you just have to uh, see what, what works for you and be authentic. So leadership to me is big, number one on the agenda for the next 20 years. Yeah, I think this question, looking looking from uh, the, the big picture, right? Not just 20 years, but look at 200 years or 2000 years, you always had low maturity levels on most organizations. You can look at ages, different industries, different territories. It's normal, right? Things come and go and maturity comes and go right? It's not something stable. You view then it stays there forever. So um, these problems that, that we, are, we are seeing, I agree. I agree that leadership has all, of, all to do about it, you know, but uh, these problems, lead time, quality, rework, and even demand, is the same problem that China faced 60 years ago, and now they are leading the industry. So problems are opportunities and you, you should take advantage of them. It's, I like the Steve Jobs saying, stay hungry, stay foolish. If you, if you are every day more aware of who you are and as a leader, as a person, as an organization, then it's great. And I think as a whole industry, we are more aware that we were 20 years ago. So I think that's a great start to pursue some improvement. Just, just do the next step, do the next experiment, and do the next movement test. Sometimes you succeed, sometimes not. Keep doing it over time. And 20 years from now, you'll be much closer to where you want to be. I agree with you, Luan. Um, I would like to share our experience when we were validating the, the better release of the Kanban maturity model and uh, we were working with many organizations, um, more than 30 organizations in parallel in different countries, different continents. And for me, it was um, a surprise uh, to see that 
companies and large organizations who had been invested in their agile initiatives and they they were running those agile initiatives for years maybe three four five years they were still at well in the terms of Kanban maturity model, this is maturity level one, team level. They were talking about developing, using, applying agile practices at team level. Uh, however, they were rather seeing their teams as islands, not connected. And they, they, there were no coordination, no communication, no collaboration between teams. Uh, and in larger services, when different teams had to be involved in them, it was kind of um, important challenge for managing these larger services or larger projects. So it's, I agree with uh, the statement that it's interesting that 20 years ago, um, the maturity of the organizations is still low. I also agree that we will also see low maturity organizations in different places and in different industries. No problem with this. Uh, uh, and uh, until they they take the first step um, and they they make improvements. Um, however, for the next twenty years, I definitely would like to see uh, more work done in the organizations to develop organizational agility to make the entire organization focused and work uh, focused on their purpose, uh, develop their purpose driven culture, develop their true focus on the customer because we often hear uh, about uh, thinking on the customer and developing work for the customer, but when you observe how organizations work internally, they do not work uh, focused on the customers. They do not make decisions with the customer in mind. So um, I would like to see this true development of the customer center, uh, center thinking. And well, especially because we are seeing uh, such array events like pandemic and war and uh, volcans and things like this, I think organizations should develop uh, their resilience as well. Their ability to sustain their functions, their services in critical situations. So this is also, uh, this is reflected in the Kanban maturity model. And uh, this is sharing ideas with the work uh, led by uh, Julian Birkinshaw from the London Business School. And I think this is very rele relevant for many organizations in the next 20 years. Okay, thank you, everyone. I'm going to head into our Q&A because it is getting hot. So quick reminder, I see, first of all, awesome discussion in our chat. I mean, you guys are taking notes and offering presentations on said notes, and I'm just kind of keeping an eye and it, it's awesome. So thank you everyone for being so active, but please submit your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, because you put them in the chat, they will drown in other people's comments and we will miss them. That being said, um, I can see that you are using the upvote feature, so I'm going to start with the questions that have been upvoted the most. So by far, the most upvoted so far is something, a question for Alistair. More than two decades later, and I think I already touched on that a bit, but more than two decades later, what, if anything, would you do differently about the manifesto? Well, um, you know, starting with the fact that we agreed that it was a product of 17 very particular people at a very particular moment in time with a particular theme in our mind, right? We were fighting a battle and so on and so forth. Taking all that into account, if we just look at um, anything that we would, we would shift, uh, you know, there were 17 people and, and we all have our heart in, tied up in some part of there and some other part we're maybe less interested in. Um, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, Shutsky's just lost his name. Uh, Mr. Crisp guy who did the who did the Spotify model. Him, anyway, he, he found a lovely solution. We we get stuck on the word software, and, and when you look at it, although it does say the manifesto fragile software development, and we were programmers, and we were talking about software. About six months later, Jim Highsmith and I looked at each other and went. This doesn't actually have a lot to do with software, does it? Right. And then immediately we've been trying since 2000 and late 2001 to get it out of software. 
So like, if you just take the manifest of the four values um, and, and people anchor on the word software too much, um, you replace that with value and you replace responding to change with responding to feedback. You make a two word change to the manifest and that's completely general. Individuals and interaction and, and forget the over part. Like it's just, we have a value center, put your energy on and two of them have to do with people and they aren't adjacent so people don't notice that. But half the manifesto is about humans, right? So we take them, just reorder them a little bit. You get individuals and interactions, customer collaboration as the first two, responding, no, delivering value, right? Delivering value and responding to feedback. Now you've got software out of the equation and, and, and now it's completely general. So if I just leave the, the manifesto in place and make a two word change and do that little reordering, uh, well, I've got everything I need you know, to do with it. Um, yeah, I don't know, change. It's, I, I keep coming back every time we think about like we doing it, we were fighting for permission to talk to customers and deliver software. We were fighting against documents and plan. We were fighting, right? We were fighting for our lives and, and that doesn't exist anymore. And so when anybody says, gee, what would the next, next manifesto be for? I go, well, first of all, don't ask me because I got mine. You, you have to find somebody who's unhappy with, the, with, with something and they'll write theirs. And all through this whole last hour, I've been just going like, where is there a battle going on? Like, where's the fight? Because we can't, and I don't know where the fight, if we could say, yeah, you know, I think that the product owner, the product uh, orientation that, super important, mega interesting. We've got the tech done. It's done, can sliced. It's cooked. It's like, that's done, right? We don't need to look at that. The whole product construction envisioning areas wide open. The whole leadership wide open. Those are great places, you know, to go spend energy, but I don't know that we're fighting a battle that we would need another manifesto for. Um, I, about eight years ago, thought I was going to go into the product design, but my heart's not there. And like everybody else here, I'm in leadership these days. You know, what does leadership mean in the, and, and leave out the word agile, just in the 21st century, we're in 2020, whatever number we're in, we're deep in the 21st century. Culture is a certain way now that it wasn't 15 years ago. We know things about leadership, blah, 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 blah. So, so there's a huge topic there. Do we need a manifesto for that? I, I don't know. I, I don't know if we're fighting a particular battle against anybody that requires a manifesto. But anyway, yeah, I'll just stop there. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. So, Mark, this question is done. Next most upvoted question. Is there a recommended pattern for scaling? And, and um, can we sharpen that question per my, my, my observation earlier? The scaling number of people when you know what the direction is and there's scaling where you have to include the fact that you have to select a direction right a priority uh, those are two different flavors of scaling at me so can we just when you answer can you kind of orient your answer in one or the other and we can include dimitar i think on this one so he also probably i was has. actually going to put luan on the screen yeah. because i know he has done that at his com previous company and they were uh -huh. very successful with that so, Lon, do you want to take this one? Sure. Um, so, Alistair, say, say again, what are the two different parts? Yeah. That so, two for scaling to me, there's two parts. All of that John manifesto really presupposed we know what direction we're supposed to go in. We have an initiative, we have a goal. Mm -hmm. We have to orient people so they get to the goal, right? Then, then all of that John manifesto fits. But at the large scale in a large organization, right at the top level, you have different division heads. And they all have, you know, if we take a telecom, like I love, I love Telstra in, in Australia, they're going to lay cable, they're gonna lay fiber, they're gonna put up satellites, they got handsets, they got ground lines, they got services, they right at the highest level, they're orienting their budget toward mm -hmm. which of those gets how much attention. And now mm -hmm. you've got not only you know nice objective thing, but you've got power, reward, embarrassment, right? That piece for me, the agile manifesto doesn't talk about. So when people say scale, I want to just separate in the conversation. I think I think it'll separate nicely, but you know you can tell me then what 
is are we adding people knowing what the initiative is? Or are we entering the realm of selecting priorities for initiatives? You see the difference? Yeah. So um, this, this has been something that I have worked for for the past eight or nine years, including telecom industry. <laughs> so uh, I think I can add a, a few cents about it. When I started working with Scrum like 10 years ago and then SAFE, I struggled a lot. SAFE has a great framework for budget management, portfolio management. I think it's one of the most interesting parts of SAFE, but implementing it it's, has so many flaws uh, in, my, in my experience. And then when I found Kanban and the Kanban maturity model, I found a solution that scales both vertically and horizontally, you know? So when you're talking about splitting the budget to pay for technical debts, to migrate into the cloud, getting out of the mainframe, things like that, or you're assigning budget to new products or to maintenance of existing products or to listening to what the customers are asking for, I think Kanban provide a structure where you can make that decisions basic based on historical data and make um, data-driven or data-oriented decisions or data-informed decisions. Now, when you align that to the middle management and the teams, can be with a bit of flight levels can help you a lot. And when you start looking at the middle management, the end-to-end -end value streams, like you're saying, and that could be anything, it could be um, order to delivery to cash or any other kind of value stream, you can identify your bottlenecks end to end, and then you can you can uh, give feedback to the executives to take decisions of what is the bottleneck, the organizational bottleneck we have, and and this is one of the most um, helpful things I found about Camerize a couple of years ago when I was trying to find what was my biggest organizational bottleneck, and I got dashboards and, and reports that helped me to, to show to the executives, to the C-level, what was the, the most um, painful bottleneck for the organization. So I think that's it. If you, if you apply the Kanban model, the same way you apply it to your team, you start what you have now, give visibility of what you're doing, quick feedback loops, and collaborate to each other, then you improve over time. You have more aligned structure and you can make better decisions at uh, the C-level portfolio management. Does it make sense? I, th I think that's right. I think that chimes with my experience. I, I also know from my experience of being part of a leadership team that was developing new products in projects that involve more than a thousand people on projects lasting multiple years it, you have a scaling challenge and the scaling challenge becomes you start a program and there's a small group of people who know what it's about and they have an idea of direction they want to travel but they don't know what the work content's going to be and more people come on board and teams grow and they start scaling and then you have this integration challenge and you have this alignment challenge and you have this communication challenge and you have this challenge of assumptions. And to Alistair's point, when, when you're in that space and the direction's not clear, it's a big challenge, right? Because you've got people who have particular motivations, particular incentives, particular behavioral traits um, that have served them well in leadership positions and they play all kinds of games. And you've got people who want to add value doing the work and they want a sense of direction, but they also want empowerment to do what they need to do. And you've got to connect them up. 
you know, so it's kind of top down in terms of direction and approach to a level. The guys are creating value and they, they've got to kind of meet in the middle a little bit. And, and the best way of managing that is to have people at all levels talking frequently, identifying and resolving problems frequently, because driving transparency, uh, driving open conversations, uh, you'll soon find out who's moving in a particular direction and who isn't. And, and things get solved, things get solved. And, and if people aren't on board, then they find that they can't operate that way and they find something that works for them. So I definitely recognize what you say, Luan. I also understand that when we're in new space and we can't use historical data because no one's ever done this stuff before, or it's of limited use, we have to connect them up and, and frequent conversations at all levels that are aligned and where there's clarity of scope of bounded empowerment within the teams and we learn and we've got fast feedback loops. I think that's the key to scaling really. And I don't think there are frameworks that describe that really well and I wouldn't expect them to because it's a complex organizational human problem where you get lots of humans together you're always going to get these problems and there's nothing that you can write that describes the pathway through that. Yeah, I would say that there are two aspects of scaling. First is managing the end-to-end -end flow of work from customer perspective. And second is the, the feedback loop. So this is the way of scaling. When you start at the team level, you have the feedback loops within the team, the daily meeting, retrospective planning of the weekly work of the team. Then when you start uh, scaling, manage always manage the end-to-end -end flow from the customer perspective. In such cases, maybe you will have to uh, connect several teams in this end-to-end -end flow. This requires additional feedback loops to ensure uh, communication flows between the teams and across the entire workflow. You always optimize for, for the entire, uh, for the final results the entire workflow, not avoiding sub-optimizations. And then if you want to start managing, continue scaling, and therefore you start managing different workflows or portfolios or um, yeah, portfolios, for example, uh, definitely you will need the additional uh, feedback loops, the operations review, the risk review in such a way that you can uh, connect and ensure that uh, you stabilize the, the workflow across all these uh, different projects or products or services that you are managing. So um, managing the end-to-end the -end flow across one workflow or different workflows and the, the feedback loops, the cadences are the and two just, aspects which I would think, which I would take into consideration when scaling. Thanks, Theo. May I just add a few sentences? Safe is the big winner in, the, in this space. Um, a lot of companies we talk to run safe. And I encourage you to, to choose what to do on a company level, but take conscious decisions why you're doing what you're doing. What is totally bad, in my opinion, is taking uh, a prescriptive approach to scaling, this is something what Keith alluded to. Don't do stuff just because somebody said so. If you find logic in these things, great. You, you may do safe and you, you can do brilliant stuff as long as you know why you're doing the things you're doing. If you're doing it because somebody said so, it, it's the wrong motivation. Just something to think about. Okay, everyone, I'm just putting it out there, we have so many questions that if while we're discussing, someone wants to, and this goes out to our audience, because I'm sure that we are a collection of very knowledgeable people here. I encourage you to type your answers to the questions in the Q&A and engage in the discussion. And maybe you have knowledge that you can provide as well. Um, I'm going to keep on going so that we can cover more. I actually missed one pre-submitted question as it was pre-submitted very last minute. So uh, this is uh, a question from Gregory. Um, what are some good techniques? Oops, oh no, sorry, my question just disappeared. What are some good techniques to answer the when will it be done question when you have to 
um, project stories that are not yet in the backlog. For instance, refinement will generate stories, performance improvement will generate stories, application security will generate stories, et cetera. I can take this one. Um, I think it's a tooling question, to be honest. So I will take the, the liberty to talk about it. If you have a decent tool that collects statistical information about what you're doing, uh, the, the, type, the types of work that you're working on and how much time they usually take, given that your process is somewhat stable, not too much uh, variation in terms of fleet and cycle times, then um, it's actually rather easy to do that because um, tools that support Monte Carlo simulations, even on the level of initiatives, can, can show you different forecasts for how much time um, this initiative or project or sprint or whatever is going to take. And specifically the question, how can you account for non-existing stories? I can talk about Kanbanize, not sure about other tools, but Kanbanize allows you to forecast scope that doesn't exist yet. Um, we ask for the number of stories that you expect to have, say 30, then we split them in the same ratio as the ones that already exist. And we forecast as if they were there already. I'm sure other tools have different solutions. I don't know them right now, but I think it's a tooling question. And if you have a decent tool, it shouldn't be uh, an impossible task. I want to hear from Keith before I give my answer. Keith, you've been, <laughs> down this road. you've been on this road more than I have. I, you know, look, I'm I'm Mr. Paper and Pencil dude, and I work on projects less than 100 people. You know, I like index cards and sticky notes and stuff. So before I give my answer, I want to hear what you've got to say on this question. Uh, I'm I'm a heretic in some of this, so I kind of I, I agree with Dimitar actually that. Uh, given a preference, because I'm a bit of a stats geek, I prefer probabilistic uh, forecasts, then yeah, it'll be done in ne this time next year. But the, we, we, I often have conversations with people who uh, tell me they're agilists uh, and they suggest that I'm not because it, it, in the larger project, we're going to have some form of master schedule and, and people go, you just can't do that. You, that's just not agile, but, but there has to be a route and a pathway to delivering value to the market for a given cost and level of investment. And there has to be some confidence that we're going to make the progress towards it. So, so, so for me, it's just the ability to relate. I hesitate to use the word velocity, but motion in a particular direction to achieve the project goals. And we've just got to assure ourselves that we're moving at the right pace to achieve the end goal, or we're not moving at the right pace at the moment, but we have an approach that enables us to move faster later because we're learning and adapting from what we're doing. And, and so it's a really difficult question, but I, for me, it's not one to get, to get wrapped up in because there are so many methods, but Ultimately, you're just seeking assurance. Are we making progress at the right rate to get to where we need to get to to deliver value? And there are many, many ways to do that. Like yeah. that, I would say, look at your data, but for sure, uh, avoid uh, committing to some delivery date or delivery time too early. Commit to, to some time when you already know that you understand everything on your work and you have capacity to deliver it and then you can give some date or some time. Before that, you can only give some probabilistic forecasting. I, I have so, so many stories, so many stories connected to this question um, that, that, that give answers pop all, it's not like one answer, they pop all over, yes, this, but that, but this, but that, but this, but that. So um, I'll just mention a couple of them. I love working for retail companies. They, they have Black Friday. Sorry, Theodora, your answer is a non-answer in, in the retail world. You cannot say, I may or may not deliver on Black Friday with some problem. No, you will deliver on Black Friday, 100% guaranteed. So I love that. I love Black Friday. Uh, it's a date. It's a fixed date. Now we've learned 
in the agile world how to, to handle that. The killer paper was a 2003, 2004 agile conference paper by Jeff Patton called Unfixing the Fixed Price Contract, uh, in which he talked about exactly how to do that. <clears throat> he spent, he and I spent, but mostly he, me pulling stuff out of his brain. Um, I teach that all the time. It's called Trim the Tail Curve. Um, you, I, I love fixed due dates, but the agile world, I, I was at a place and this guy comes into the meeting and says, I love Agile because I just came from a meeting and said I couldn't promise him a due date. I said, I'm short selling stock in your company. That's no way to run a company. You can't run a company that way. I'm sorry, dates exist. I don't honor the we, Agile means there's no date. And, and I go all over the world talking to CEO, CIO, CTO who says, my programmers tell me to do an Agile they can't give me a date. I go, bullshit, sorry. It, no, it can be done. There's ways to do it. So that's one dot. There's a couple of dots right there. This technique <clears throat> I learned from um, a guy in Germany. I call it blitz planning. Uh, I use it for small projects. I sat on an airplane next to the guy who de who who designed the the Delta terminal in, in in Salt Lake City and in Boston. And so he did big projects, Keith. You know, hard. You know, sheet metal, all that stuff. He did the exact same planning method that I did, which is just sticky notes and dates and times, and you push them around the wall or the, or the table or whatever. And, you, and, and that's how you deal with that. There's another data point. So you can do that and you apply that blitz planning. Little known, another data point. Uh, the first extreme programming project in 1995, six, seven, eight was a one year fixed price, fixed scope project. They estimated everything out for a year. They had no idea how long anything was gonna take, but they estimated it all out. And there was a six figure bonus writing on whether they delivered it or not. So again, it was not a probably maybe something they had, it was important, right? So we have all of these data points. And at the same time, I remember being on a project and doing three month deliveries. And at the beginning of the three months, looking at our estimates and going, I don't know what that means, <laughs> right? And then, you know, big rocks, big lumpy estimates and small rocks, small height estimates, right? So, um, and it, the last short story that I recall with great fondness, I was in France and there was this like 10 months left in this project. <clears throat> and I, the, the variation of blitz planning I used, I said, everybody, 24 people, all my projects under 100, 24 people, everybody write down everything you have to do. Like you all know what project you're on, right? They all wrote it down and I got masking tape and I put 10 boxes on the floor. And I said, here's October, November, December, 10 months out. Everybody drop your cards into the box where you think it needs to be due, right? Everybody knows a bit about that. So they all did that. And we literally counted the number of cards in each box. So it was like 14, 15, and then December got 18 cards. And I said, you know, there's only two work weeks in December. You can't do 18 cards in December, right? You can break a plan that fast. There's stuff you can do, even with all the unknowns, right? So I literally don't honor the, just, I, oh, last story is relevant. It came to us as a <laughs> company, Black Friday, and they were having some trouble. And I, for me, the problem was that people would, the, the, the sales team would say, could we have this by Black Friday? Or could we have this? The team would start working and then it would grow and grow and grow and be huge. And the sales teams would say, actually, I never wanted anything that big to begin with. Like if it's more than three months work, I literally, I don't want it. Right, so don't do that. Um, and so what we were trying to get into place was that the salespeople would say, this is worth about this many weeks or months of work. If you can't do it in that, then like no bid. And then the teams would look at it and if they would bid, then they would use the trim the tail techniques to hit there. And, but so there's ways to play this. Okay, we got all my stories. And I feel sorry for the translators because that was really fast. <laughs> Luan, hey, you're muted. Yes. I, I, I heard so many stories. I remember one here as well. Um, back in January, <laughs> February 2020, we were migrating all the stickers on the walls to, to Cambonize back on the, on the company I, I used to work, right? We were migrating like 25 to 30 teams from from walls, walls stickers to to Cambonize. And what a coincidence, right? If we if we waited another month or so to 
to migrate uh, the physical cards to digital boards, we would be so screwed. After the lockdown, it was very difficult. It would be very difficult. So um, I think I think digital is more reliable, right? <laughs> and you can spread across regions and so on and so forth. Uh, there is another story, but I will we'll talk about it uh, in the evening here in Brazil. It will be in Portuguese. It's about probabilistic forecasting. Uh, and whoever speaks Portuguese, unfortunately, we won't have interpreters there, maybe in the future. But whoever wants to join us, just check for <laughs> Camarais Brazil Meetup this evening. <laughs> what do you think, group? Do we have time to squeeze in one more question with the no, 12 I'm, upvotes? No, I got, I have to go. So I'm out. I, sorry, I have somebody coming over. Hmm. Okay, I know there are the questions, Veronica, that you know, but best we get some good discussion on fewer questions. It's time box, right, Alistair? <laughs> and just I'll think all the calendar and agenda and it's got colors and yeah. Okay, so in that case, some parting words. <laughs> I just want to thank you all. Great panel, great stuff, great audience, great discussions. It's been a dream coming true for me. Thank you very much. I want to thank you, Divitar, for assembling a fabulous set of panelists. This has been the richest discussion I've had on these topics since I've been So it's fine. Thank you. Amazing. And that was our goal. Any tale? Would you have some final words? Thank you very much, Divitar. And thank you, Alistair and Kate and Luan and Veronica for this uh, exciting and very nice panel. I enjoyed it a lot. And Good luck with all CanConf, with the next CanConf. <laughs> I'm going to recommend them to all the people. <laughs> yeah, Thank I've loved it. I've, likewise, I've loved it and learned loads. So it's been my privilege to uh, to learn with you. Thank you, It was an honor. Thank you very much. And thank you, Veronica, for organizing everything. It was amazing. <laughs> My pleasure. Keep your eyes peeled, everyone. There's more CanConf mini conferences to come. Follow us on LinkedIn and uh, keep posted. This recording will become available to everyone. It will follow up in your email. So just make sure to check your emails, check your spam as well. Thank you, everyone, for being here. What a wonderful discussion this has been. I hope we've added value on this Thursday for you, and we will see you next time. Bye.